Boards, games, boards, games, it's what I'm talking about. Boards, games, boards, games, I'm not gonna shout. We are starting off this morning with a little bit of singing and over to talk about the things on the board is the person known as glenn ford <laughs> glenn <laughs> ford has made many many games and glenn ford is glenn ford's name <laughs> games and miniatures that's what we're talking about board games and miniatures i'm not gonna shout hey it's morning <laughs> very very splendid <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, hello, Kate. It is lovely to see you back after I missed you yesterday. Um, Kate feels like some of that was cheating. <laughs> hey, um, it's just there to entertain. And if I if I manage to make the guests laugh, if I manage to entertain you watching, then I feel like I've succeeded. And it doesn't matter I, how bad rhymes are. I I I, I think my last name just fell nicely for 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 a song about board games i don't i, I don't think you can count that as cheating <laughs> i am bez this is bedtime in some countries we are blethering about board games and today in particular i am here with glenn ford who has previously worked with osprey games on gaslands and we're going to talk about things like gaslands like warhammer like malifaux Maybe like let, comparing them a tiny bit to stuff that's come out of Kickstarter recently, but just what are miniatures? How do these things differ? And what is a good miniatures game? And have they been able to evolve at all recently? And so that's what's going to come up today. Um, do you wish to say anything more about the subject as the quick one minute preview? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think. One one of the things about uh, tabletop miniatures games now is what what makes a, a boxed tabletop miniatures game and what makes a let's call it a non boxed tabletop miniatures game. And I'd like to sort of yeah talk a bit a little bit about maybe what some of the differences are and yeah as you said where where some boxed tabletop miniatures games have gone with Kickstarter versus sort of general retail and what the difference is between those and the more I would say more sort of hobby end uh, version of, of of games that use miniatures on the tabletop. So yeah, should be fun. Should be interesting. Yeah, and obviously we can draw a line back to like I don't know, Little Wars, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, going going yeah, properly old school back to HG Wells and uh, and military training, um, which mm -hmm. I've, uh, yeah, and we we can yeah we can like I think hopefully talk about possibly why it is those games haven't broken out and moved on from lining up and two forces lining up and slaughtering each other seems to be a a, a big part in, in in that sort of area of the hobby which i think is increasingly a shame but we can get onto that hopefully at, at a later point possibly and hello alex it is lovely to see you with us and also chris thank you for joining us again i mean everyone just yeah some saying they wish they could paint but only really only for one game i think i know which game that is i think we're talking about scythe there um i'm going to assume speaking of box games with miniatures but um yeah we all do the best we can and good morning paul i hope that um thank you very much um it's just lovely to see you don't feel obliged to stick around keep on doing the great rule book editing that you are doing and um just curious how long have you been playing games with miniatures since uh me Ooh. yeah um i suppose so uh, i think a lot of people i got into the hobby um with games workshop and way you know uh, way back when it was uh, for me it was hero quest and space hulk were my introduction to to, to tabletop uh, sort of miniatures gaming, and like a lot of uh, young people, um, 
as as Games Workshop well know is the situation, once you've got the boxed game and you've already got mm. X many minis, they then go, oh, by the way, here's this other thing you can play with minis. And you pick up, and for me, it was originally 40K, um, and then into Fantasy Battle, um, and uh, went for a time of being... I, I, I was a big uh, tournament gamer, um, uh, got very sort of uh, hardcore into playing Fantasy Battle for a, for, for, for a long, long time. Um, so I guess, I, I mean, I've been playing miniatures, uh, sort of full tabletop miniatures games since I guess I was around about... Uh, 13 14 and playing box games with miniatures younger than that when i was sort of whatever nine or ten um yeah so most of my life know, are you okay dating yourself could you say what I, that was uh yeah so i i'm I, well i'm 41 now uh so that so would be since 1986 ago. i guess with hero quest and then 1989 1990 i guess would be when i really started playing uh 40k um the last for people this will mean something to people who it will mean something to my last 40k game was uh the original original gene stealer cult versus squat <laughs> uh and then then f fancy battle all the way through to uh the, the the death of the warhammer world I'm one of the rare people who played through the whole of the end times campaign from Blood of Sigma to to the to the actual end of of the Warhammer world. And then I think for for a lot of people um after the death of the Warhammer world uh I think I was part of that group of people whose heads came up and sort of looked around for what else there was and from that point onwards I was always playing uh, Malifaux and a little bit of uh, War Machine, and then it's been sort of looking at things from Test of Honor, um, Saga. Just there's such a, a bigger, 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 bigger world out there at the moment, and I think a certain amount of that has been a little, a little explosion for some people once. Fancy Battle officially died and became Age of Sigma. Uh, a little bit of it has been just a general indie scene. Um, and yeah, I think I think it's I think it's a it's an interesting and fertile fertile area at the moment for the number of uh, systems and games that are available. Um, and I personally, uh, I would really like to see some of them diversify out a little bit in what they try to do uh, and the stories they try mm. to tell. Like I can say, hopefully, we'll we'll sort of chat about that for sure. And I love Paul's quote. The best thing about Hero Quest is all the people <laughs> it brought into the hobby. That is a lovely take on that. <laughs> the muscularity. Um, <laughs> and um, Alex, you wag. <laughs> I love miniatures games. I always keep a copy of Sprawlopolis. <laughs> <laughs> miniature, yeah. Anyway. Different miniature. So um, let's get to something completely different now. Just for a wee bit, let's talk about brilliant things, brilliant things, what a little thing which is brilliant. Uh, so I guess my I've got a few little brilliant things uh, here. My brilliant thing for the moment is uh, the, the, the knitted meeple that my, my, my wife made. Uh, but we've got a, a handful of knitted things. We've got a little knitted ninja uh, that just sits on the Aww. shelf. And I've uh, got a little knitted chicken. <laughs> <laughs> um yes we've got um my my wife knits and uh, and makes little things and sort of uh sometimes sells them and but the the cuter ones sort of get get left around the flat so um and i i i think i bought i, I mentioned the knitting earlier with bears because i don't know how well you can see but um this chair I've oh, had. You since will probably you... have to pick it up again. <laughs> uh, this chair I've had since uh, I was a young person. It's uh, it's sort of leather covered, but eventually the leather comes off. So we've got an entirely <laughs> knitted cover from my chair to stop it it flaking and uh, and falling off whenever it gets sat on. So so my 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 brilliant thing I guess is 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 random knitted knickknacks around my home. And so yeah, I think that. Knitting, it's like just a way to express love. You can use it for reupholstering, as we've seen. We can use it for just um, ornaments. You can use it for jumpers or sweaters or anything. So what I'm basically taking is that knitting is brilliant. Knitting is absolutely brilliant. Mm. 
So yeah, in the comments, let us know, do you knit? And also, now as we move into the recent highlights, recent highlights, recent highlights, living life and seeing the sights, recent highlights, recent highlights, playing games and other delights, recent highlights. So feel free to share anything that you want to. Um, obviously, if you don't, then don't feel, don't share, like if you don't want to share then. But um, yeah, here's, um, I had a date, sorry, I'm going to move you up just so that people can see you better later on. Um, so I had an actual date, we've been talking about this, it was a second date in that I've been on, like we had many hours of conversation, before like we met up and then yeah the first date we just kind of had a distance to walk through the park this time we actually met in a restaurant and I know it's kind of crazy times and there is a little bit of guilt but they did have big plastic barriers between people it was lovely food and it's a lovely person we walked around we talked we dined we drank for like four hours and then you know said goodbye in Covent Garden, so that's me just after we said goodbye, because there's a big, um, I don't know what it's made of, it's met, it's shiny. Um, <laughs> anyway, there's this big spheroid object in the centre of Covent Garden. There, you can see it better. And yeah, that's Covent Garden. So that was definitely my highlight of yesterday. And so even in this day and age, you know, I think that you need to be sensible. It's not something that I suddenly want to go out and go to a restaurant every week or anything like that. And But we do need to have some sort of um, it, mental health and social physical connection as well sometimes. I don't know. You've got to stay sane. Yeah. Um, now, Paul says, note for Glenn. Paul grew up playing Car Wars and had the little minis for it. That was um, the prequel to Cattle Battle, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> By Steve Jackson Games, right? Car Wars um, coming from Steve Jackson Games. Then they did a parody of their own game called Cattle Battle, or am I mixing this up? Uh, I, I, I think possibly, yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I, I think... Well, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, Car Wars is the is a Steve Jackson's game. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, and yeah. Cattle Battle is definitely also a Steve Jackson game. So, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. I, th yeah, I think Cattle Battle might, yeah, might have been a a, a sort of self made parody of Car Wars. I think <laughs> calling Car Wars the prequel to Cattle Battle would be a very weird way of uh, <laughs> replacing Car yeah, Wars. Sorry, I was being a bit facetious. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, Car Wars, yeah. And it's like Car Wars is a thing that most people know. It just so happens that I've got a copy of Cattle Battle and I've <laughs> never played Car Wars. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah, Car, so, Car Wars is obviously... De developing Gaslands Car Wars is very much something that came up to us uh, multiple times and we were sort of saying... Um, Todd, I'd love to love Gaslands for never had a time to try. I mean, I would say this, but you, you probably would love it. Uh, if uh, the, I suppose the, the the quick sell for Gaslands versus Car uh, Car Wars is that if Car Wars is zoomed right in on the dashboard uh, of your car second by second, Gaslands is pulled right the way back out again. Um, if you find the idea of ending the race upside down and on fire but because you flipped your car as you blew up and got caught on fire and that caused you to cross the finishing line and therefore you'll win the race, then you'll enjoy Gaslands. Mm. And so, um, yeah, if you want a lot of carnage, then yes, yeah. you might enjoy Gaslands. Yeah, a lot um, of cinematic and silliness and yeah, yeah, things blowing up. Good morning, Leaf the East. I don't know how to, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And thank you very much telling me to not feel too guilty as long as I was taking sensible precautions, which I was. Um, whenever I got up to use the loo, I kind of, or whenever the server was coming over, I made sure to put on the masks just so that I wasn't transmitting anything. And so thanks for the um, love there. And anyone else, feel free to share what are your recent highlights. Glenn, what were your recent highlights? 
Oh, uh, I guess uh, things we've been playing. Um, I've recently started getting into uh, Gloomhaven on Tabletop Simulator with uh, my uh, the group of gaming friends that I would normally meet up, and we've been trying to get uh, playtesting done for some some upcoming releases. Um, and Gloomhaven, something that I've wanted to sort of try out because you obviously you hear a lot about it. Um, but the thing of getting people together week in and week out uh so we started on that and we've also uh we started playing uh clank on uh, tabletop simulator which is uh uh a lot of uh, yeah a lot of fun uh a good sort of uh, it's an interesting break from i wouldn't say the two ends of, of, of probably that seems harsh but the, the sort of the quite hardcore depth of of gloomhaven and the sort of slightly more foolish end of, of clank so <laughs> Um, and then obviously, uh, as I guess with a lot of people have been playing some solo games, uh, so uh, recently got a copy of uh, The Bloody Inn, um, which is a nice little, uh, I say nice, it's about murdering people in a hotel in the <laughs> countryside. But it's, oh, it's uh, such a sweet little game. <laughs> yeah, 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 but it, it's, it's, it's a good little solo uh, puzzler game. Uh, I've got a copy of uh, Petricor sat, uh, sat on the shelf at the moment for... Um, for checking out uh on its on its solo mode so yeah looking forward to, to getting that down it's at least a beautiful game i haven't actually played it yet but it is stunning uh the components and and, and what's in the box yeah there. by david shercop i want to see with a little bit of development from dave turksy uh yeah i mean i can see the Petra side of the Cork. box and i see a, i see a david yeah i see a david on the name so it looks like i i'm gonna i'm gonna call that good i'm memory. fairly sure it's shercop and turksy anyway so, so. Um, where you've got the cloud, and I think I played it when it was just about going to print, and it's interesting because hmm, it's quite a meat, not that meaty, but like you think, okay, because it's about clouds, it's going to be this little fluffy game. I don't know, because clouds are fluffy and... Um, no, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. and apparently Petricor has a rule book and video from Paul. Oh, well, okay. if you want to check out um, how to play Petricor, because you are curious about what it would be like to play a game where you are this little fluffy cloud going along and p building up your water and propagating these plants. It's kind of not just about the clouds, though, is it? It's all no, about yeah. the plants and what you're growing. It's yes, yes, like, it's about what you as the cloud gives back to the plant growing community. Mm. <laughs> it's about your relationship as cloud with the land. It's I mm. really love this just because it is such a different theme. Mm. And that's what um uh, oops. Um <laughs> Paul says it's a tactical <laughs> war game disguised with a theme of clouds and raining on crops. Yep, I would sure. Um Xate says that a recent highlight for them was learning on Mars yesterday, and on Mars will not leave Xate's thoughts. Xate feels like they just need this game. I mean, I've heard this is good. Have you played this at all? Uh, on on Mars, no, no, I don't. Mm. I don't think I've, I've played uh, terraforming Mars, but uh, not not on Mars. No. Well, just There's... because it has names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It. just because it's got it's got the word Mars in it. They're they're presumably. It, this remind, this the reminds me thing. of the year that. Do you remember that year that American Beauty, American Pie, and American Psycho all came out in the same year? And for ages, I was like, "How did this happen? Like, were they connected somehow?" <laughs> like American Beauty, okay, I loved that film. American Pie, yeah, it was a decent. It was okay. <laughs> um, American Psycho, mm, it's not my kind of thing. Anyway, so it's just, like. These things are in the zeitgeist. Different. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah. Things are just in in the uh, in the communal psyche. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I've I've got I've got quite a shelf of games to play, and I don't see anything Mars related on that at the moment. So, mm. <laughs> on Mars, um, also has a rule book and tutorial video from Paul, <laughs> but it's about. Oof, phew, I didn't mark my top. Need to put down this pen and stop fiddling. But it's about <laughs> hundred items as complex as Petrocore, apparently. Yike. So um let's move on um to the questionably quick questions. Feel free to share your own personal highlights if you want. Uh, but now we move to the section where we put Glenn under the spotlight. 
for about five minutes or so until we run out of interesting things to ask Glenn. <laughs> and so for the next wee bit, it is time for the questionably quick questions. Are you ready? Uh, yep. <laughs> okay. Where exactly are you? Uh, I'm in Deal, near Dover in the southeast of Kent, and I'm in my front room. Hmm. What do you think of God Tier? Uh, I I don't know an enormous amount uh, about God Tier. I've not played it. I've seen it. Um, it looks it looks large. Is is what it looks like to uh, to uh, that's that yeah that's as much as I'm willing to commit to that one. It's like a big game. Could you summarize Gaslands in exactly eight words? No more, no less. Uh. <laughs> The post-apocalyptic game of car carnage. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> carnage. Do you have any thoughts on Sundrop minis? Uh, Sundrop. Uh, again, no. I think I that's haven't... the kind of paint, a new paint. Oh, um... I don't know. Uh, I've I I I I stopped ca keeping up with uh, new painting techniques when uh, non-metallic metal became a big thing. Um, I'm I'm a, I'm a speed painter for the tabletop. I can get through an army in about two or two days, and the quality doesn't get any better if I spend two months on it. So uh, it's 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 a unit every hour for me uh, for for mm. painting. What is your proudest moment? Oh, um, I suppose at the, at the moment uh, I, I would I would put that as I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna plump for for getting my master's degree. Mm. Um, there have been yeah, there's uh, you know there have been a lot of big moments. Um, of my 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 wedding was a very proud moment, um, and certainly um, getting getting my first game. Uh, actually backed on Kickstarter was a was a huge moment because you you never know if the world's going to be interested in the crazy things that you think are amusing until 500 strangers turn up and go yeah yeah we'll we'll give you a run on that one yeah congratulations on all of that and hello you Hohen. lovely to see you um I was going to ask you speaking of Kickstarter can you give us a little taste of the emotional rush of your first Kickstarter, <sighs> I, I I I I wrote a blog actually uh, shortly after finishing the first Kickstarter about how much of an emotional roller coaster ride uh, doing a Kickstarter is, um, because I think there's a lot of things you can be prepared for. Um, you, the, the 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 emotions of a Kickstarter are, are, are something that. People, I don't think people necessarily talk about from the the first twenty four hours when you you realise that total strangers are willing to come in and back you on this thing. The first cancellations where you realise that total strangers also hate your thing and want to just tease you by offering you money and then ripping it away from you for no good reason. Uh, the, the moment when you actually hit funded and you realise that this thing that you've been mucking about with for the past year or two is actually going to physically exist and end up in people's hands as long um, as you do the work well yes obviously there are plenty <laughs> plenty of situations where that moment does not result in a thing ending up in people's hands the weird period in between when you get funded and you uh, and then waiting to uh, where it then becomes everybody else's job to print the thing and ship the game to you and then the mad frenzy of actually fulfilling it i i self fulfilled my first game um, and the mad frenzy of annoying people at the post office by turning up with boxes, um, you know, day in and day out mm. for a week and a half. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's 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 an it's an insane thing. From I mean, the 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 first the first backers, uh, I think, are a huge uh, emotional rush. Um, I found that actually hitting funded certainly on my first campaign, we didn't hit funded until a good two weeks in. And it was that sort of 1% a day thing. And so actually hit getting funded was more of a sort of white knuckles tension. When, it, when is the last percent going to come in? I've been saying for a week, we've been like 
four percent off for the best part of a week why can't we just get over the finish line um but certainly those first 24 hours is is a real uh uh, sort of emotional rush of total, you know, total strangers coming in and saying, "I think this thing is great. I want it to exist. Here's some money. Here's even money, so it will exist. Not only I, I don't just like it. I'm willing to give you hard-earned cash for it." Um, is 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 something that's yeah, a very exciting time, very th very thrilling thing to have happen. You mentioned your blog already. There's been a lot of great articles on here. Is it all written by you, or is it a combination of you and Jen? Uh, yes, yeah, so my my blog I write. Um, Jen does uh, gaming uh, reviews as uh, Jenny Knitting by the Sea, and she's on We're Not Wizards and uh, Girls Gamer Shelf. Uh, my my blog on the on the Mannequin page is entirely me and it's sort of half 50 50 split into my sort of opinions and ramblings about kickstarter and tabletop miniatures games and and things of that nature and reviews of uh things that i think are interesting or or that just turn up on my doorstep for whatever reason so and as you say you've oh wait so i was trying to um find it and something is going wrong sorry um there we go it's blog too because google apparently had if you google it then it saved the old thing for some reason and uh yeah wix wix recently switched us from one blog system to another blog system so i'm still trying to clean out some of the old uh old blog entries um i don't i don't know why this happened but yeah yeah, it looks very different. But um, also, can you give a quick um, sum up your second Kickstarter in exactly nine words? Um, <laughs> uh, I can do a lot less than nine words. Uh, Moonflight, the deck unbuilder, um, set in dark fairy tale world. There we go. That's okay. nine words. Yeah, I like it. No more, no less. <laughs> yeah, and, managed to get um, it that way. Our final question is, if you could have a miniature made of you in any game, what would it be? Uh, um, in which game? Yeah, I think uh, it's like, you can have a I miniature mean, of you in any game. Which game would you like to be in? What kind of pose? I I I I suppose if it, it, it would it would have to be Inquisitor because the, those those were enormous miniatures and if I'm going to have a mini I want it to be a proper uh, a shelf display model um, and but if it's going to be Inquisitor then that means I'm either going to be in power armor or a horribly mutated um, sort of nurgle infested thing of some nature so I suppose it would have to be it would it would yeah, I go for the power armor option uh, Inquisitor. Yes. Uh, Inqui I, would, <laughs> I mean, given the two options, I would personally go for the horribly mutated version of myself. <laughs> well, maybe, even... a, maybe a demon host. I might. I'd. I'd. I'd, I'd be willing to go for a demon host. Uh, something. Something floating in chains. Yeah. Yeah. Proper <laughs> sort of. Yeah. Proper Inquisitor scale. Yay big. <laughs> you know. No. Nobody will ever play with it because Inquisitor. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> and Krista had it had its own issues, but it, it is it, it would at least be a stunning a stunning mini. Okay, um, apparently that is the correct answer. We've determined. <laughs> um, oh yes, um, that reminds me. I did have one request from someone who can't be here. Would you prefer wooden meatballs or plastic figurine? Uh, personally, I, I prefer a wooden meeple. Um, mm. uh, I, um, I mean, certainly in a boxed game, um, personally, I, I want to see a boxed tabletop game that justifies a plastic miniature in a game for a game design reason. I would love, love, love to see that game happen. Um, in my personal opinion, if you don't justify a game design reason for the miniature, then you shouldn't put it in the box. But that's 
that's that's that that's my personal opinion and that's how i feel about about buying things i think that there's a whole range of other things that justify a plastic miniature going into a box don't get me wrong but that, that those those things don't weigh heavily with me personally as a as 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 a as a consumer and a gamer um i think part of that is possibly because of i've got a background of tabletop miniatures games so there's a limit of how how beautiful i find a plastic miniature but that's uh i mean let's just start the discussion here let's just start the discussion with the whole justification why do you have these minis and as we move in i want to say okay we're talking about this feel free to comment ask questions we're moving a bit more on topic now from like follow all that good stuff i've got 19 more followers on youtube and then I get to have a proper name. So if you haven't already, <laughs> please follow me on YouTube. Um, but um, so you're you're talking about what's the design justification? But I want to kind of challenge that because look, I can play Malifaux with hmm. cardboard squares or like just use the bases of the miniatures. I don't really need the miniatures in that game. Same with War Machine. I mean, hmm. sure, you've got to check line of sight. But there's nothing to say that the you can't use the stands and say, okay, can you be able to see the stands? It doesn't feel like an essential part of it. Um, so I think that I, I mean personally, I think that there's quite a sort of uh, there's a continuation through from something like, for example, an Osprey Blue Book, where it doesn't they don't have a miniatures line attached. You buy uh, a rule set. You then find the miniatures that you think are suitable to fill in, in the t on the tabletop through to the full boxed game. And I personally, I'm of the opinion that something like, uh, and, and you've got a little bit of a continuum there through Malifaux and War Machine onto the Star Wars uh, tabletop miniatures game, are somewhere in the middle where... You can people you, you can play Malifaux and someone can go, oh, you're proxying a mini for another mini and, and mm -hmm. feel like they need to state that at the start of the game. And I come from a gaming background where the idea of someone saying, oh, you're, you're proxying something doesn't make any sense. It's like it's on the right size base and the mini is roughly the right height to check line of sight. Proxy sort of doesn't make any sense to me in a, in, in a sort of in a tabletop miniature game sort of environment um and yeah i think that the 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 necessity for a specific miniature um in a tabletops miniatures game i don't think there's necessarily a game design sort of justification for that i think that in uh the you know in in th the in, that you could certainly play with a third mill base with a cut out like um infinity come with a little square cut out uh silhouette for your minis and say yeah sometimes mm. stand that in and i think that's and i think there's i think there's three parts of what makes uh sort of tabletop miniatures worthwhile um to sort of be in a game i think that there's the the game design justification for them uh and that has to do with the nature of building what I'm going to call a sort of analog game, um, insofar as a game like, for example, a, ga a game like, let's say, Monopoly for for a super mm. well known box game. There's no step between one space and another. You move exactly sure. four spaces. You can't move three and a half. A game like Warhammer, there's an infinite number of degrees that you can move between four inches and eight inches. Um, those sorts of tabletop miniature games are true, uh, truly analog. There is an infinite number of choices in in any given turn um, because you can you can pivot an infinite number of degrees. You can move an infinite number of uh, degrees of of an inch. Um, and being able to say, okay, here's a sandbox set of rules for your terrain collection, your table size the miniatures you're going to choose to put on the tabletop. And if you don't want to use miniatures for it and you want to use cardboard cutouts, that's fine. Game don't care. You know, uh, as long as I say everyone uses things of roughly the same volume and the rules tell you what to do in relation to that abstract volume that you're using, 
um, then then that's you know what I sort of think of as a tabletop miniatures game. And yeah, there are the, the a tabletop miniatures game does not mean a miniatures range. And there are tabletop miniatures games that come with a range, and then there are tabletop miniatures come that come with a range that comes with a card or a widget or a piece of something you physically need to physically play the game that requires you to own that miniature in order to have the game mechanics to play the game. And th that comes into, I think, what the second reason for putting miniatures into a game is, and that's a marketing decision. And mm. I don't, I don't think that there's necessarily a bad thing about putting marketing into a game. Marketing, you know, good marketing can create a, a community to a game, and a community to a game makes a game stronger, and a stronger community makes a better game. And so, I don't think that marketing is the is the Satan of 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 the of, of oh, the hobby sure world. Oh, for sure not. Like I've had marketers um, but, on this show before, and mm. I think that there's this idea that marketing is evil when in its most benign mm. way, it's just saying, hey, there's this thing that I think you'll like, and I think that it will bring value to you, but I don't think you've mm. heard of it. Why not check mm. this out? And if your yeah. thing is worth marketing, like, in that sense, but let's not get bogged down into this whole side tangents of marketing being mm. evil, because I still want to um, nail down into the design justification of a miniatures game. And I understand that this is going to be a bit of an awkward question because um, you talk about how, yes, you can chuck in standees and for sure Malifaux where you've got the card that um, corresponds to a particular miniature, you want to kind of know what corresponds to that what, but hey, you could in theory have like a circle that has the person's, you know, picture on it. And that mm. could actually just serve absolutely the same purpose. It seems yeah. to me like the fundamental, um, logically, like in, maybe not experientially, for sure having the miniatures makes you experience the game in a different way. But in terms of logically, in terms of raw mechanisms, it feels like the only difference in a miniatures game is the analog measurements, which you mentioned. Mm. Mm. And so... What is the design justification of a miniatures ever? Um, if if you mean literally the physical mi miniature in a game, um, yes. I I I think that the the yeah, wherein the wherein you get an actual a game that cares about. Which, I mean, uh, we were talking about Inquisitor earlier the, with with the sort of six inch tool minis that would be the game that if you really wanted to get hardcore into it totally justifies the existence of a miniature because inquisitor has rules for okay if one eye it can see round the corner but not the other eye there's going to be uh you know alterations mm. on how you aim and how you deal with things if someone can see x percentage of your body if you've got one hand you know, over over the over the wall as opposed to the other hand. It, you, you know, you need for a full justification. Maybe you can get that sort of deep into it. And, and where the sort of um, where the flow goes from that level through to a game that says, okay, if you can see fifty percent of the person over the wall, you get a modifier. If you can't, um, and I think that for the game design justification, yeah, as opposed to. Um, uh, uh, just a standee and a base. I don't think that a. It's very rare that a miniature fully justifies 100% the game design decision to put it into a game. I think it happens. I, I, I think there are games out there that do it. I think it's a lot rarer than than those games turn up. Um, I think that one of the things about putting miniatures into a game is that for a lot of games, miniatures are. A, are an option. A lot of the tabletop miniatures games I'm talking about, miniatures are a, are a choice rather than a requirement. Um, you know, you you totally can. I've played entire games of Warhammer with cut out pieces of paper for uh, for, for for units and an assumption that everything is two inches tall, and it works just fine. And then if you want to put miniatures into it, there's your choice to enter into a hobby community there. Um, it's like when when we when we put together Gaslands, a huge part of it was to say, okay, this is the game that you don't. This is a miniatures game you don't need to buy a miniature for. You've already mm. got for it anyway. 
Um, we, we we don't produce a miniatures line. You know, if you own some Hot Wheels cars, stick them on the table. You've now got rules for them. Um, or if you've got a friend who's got a collection of several hundred little cars. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and I think, and I think this is the thing. I think uh, you know, a, a, at its best, a tabletop miniatures game um, should hopefully be a set of interesting rules um, that you can use miniatures to play with if you want to dress up your table, but that ultimately doesn't doesn't care so long as it's a game that is concerned about line of sight to things and mm. and analog movement of things and if you're willing to do it with a, a a 25 30 mil base and everything is two inches high and and you know 30 mil square then then i don't think that's a major issue to it um i think that what makes those sorts of games what they are is not that they've got physical miniatures in them. I think it's about the physical act of moving around a tabletop of any given space where you've laid out the terrain in any given way and that you have a, a sandbox of gaming creativity available to you there. Um, mm. I mean, the, the the game that we've got coming out, and I I, I don't mean to sort of plug things, but uh, no, in, in feel February... Feel free, if it's relevant, <laughs> please do. Uh, so the game that's coming out from Osprey in February, uh, A Billion Suns, is a deep space battle game. And mm. uh, what's weird about it is that you play on more than one tabletop. And they don't need to be tabletops. Any flat surface will do. So that you can, because it's a deep space game, so you can go, okay, that table there is the sun, and that table over there is Alpha Centauri, and I'm going to jump my ship from one Stargate to another to interact with what's going over on over there several light years away. Um, and that thing of being able to say, have you have you got three flat surfaces within arms for each of you? Brilliant. One of them's a star system, one of them's a planetary system, and one of them's uh, you know, a a, a a deep space mining, you know, uh colony. Uh make that into a world for yourself. There you go. Um those 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 are the things that um, that I personally really love about, uh, you know, what was called tabletop miniatures games, is that they open up a world of, of of sort of storytelling with a bunch of relatively mundane objects. I think this is really interesting. Oh, and bye, Paul. Again, lovely to have you with us. Um, I think. Yeah, jumping from table to table, that sounds like a really interesting thing. And also what you said, is it Inquisitor that does this with these six-inch minis where it's a certain percentage of your body being visible mm. that kind of gets into that level of specificity? Mm. And it seems like, um, again, this gets into the, you know, with miniatures games, because it is analog, there's a lot more scope for disagreement. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And like when you've got War Machine tournaments, I remember people saying, well, look, if you can't agree on whether this is in range or not in range, if you generally can't agree, like first, like the judge comes over, but if one of you is like clearly wrong or abusing the but it's going to come down to roll a die to, or mm. flip a coin to see whether it's in range or not. But yeah. obviously you don't want it to be like, okay, it's one inch away. And someone says, no, that's clearly in range. At which yeah. point, judge. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, ta uh, yeah, table miniatures games, I think, open themselves up to interpretation by, by their very nature. The very nature of that analog, you could have an infinity of things within your um, your terrain collection. And I, I don't know what they're going to look like. And I try to tell you how to judge whether you can see somebody through a window or round a wall. But, you know, there's always going to be disagreements. One of, um, one of the, uh, the, the a rule that we brought up as a joke originally in Gaslands and has ended up being one of our smartest things we ever did is a rule called the Rule of Carnage. And the Rule of Carnage says, if there's ever any disagreement in Gaslands, whichever thing causes the most carnage was the right decision. Um, so mm. if you ask whether something is in range, it must be in range because you ask the question and it would be more carnage based if the thing were in range. Um, and, and uh, you know, we did it originally as a sort of a silly thing. And it's genuinely the smartest thing we ever did because you never have to have an argument in Gaslands. You never have to split a decision. If you're asking the question, you know, it's whatever makes stuff blow up, you know, most severely. I like it. Um, <laughs> taking a step back. And I think Alex has been talking about, um, yeah, some games where you 
move stuff around, you measure stuff, and it is actually using cards. Mm. And I don't know, I've definitely seen this in at least one thing myself, where it's basically, hey, here's a miniatures game, but actually it's just a deck of cards, and every, it's like, Warhammer fantasy or something mm. where you've got like an entire battalion of things. That's okay. Here's mm. this one card. Um, would would you call that a miniatures game? I mean, old versions of uh, of Warhammer Fantasy Battle came out with with cardboard standees. So if if Warhammer is going to be the 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 standby example of a miniatures game, and I think for most people it is. The fact that there were editions that came out as cardboard standees suggests that that shouldn't rule something out from being a miniatures game. I mean, what the definition of what I consider a tabletop miniatures game, uh, and this is probably something that a lot of people give a lot of thought to, but it, it takes up an unusual amount of my time because I'm because I do uh, boxed games and I do miniatures games. And it's one of the mm. oddest things to me is that there's very little crossover, say, in the convention scenes between those two. If you go to, uh, in the UK, Salute is the biggest uh, miniatures tabletop convention of the year, and then you go to UKGE, um, th there's not a lot of crossover between the people who are exhibiting and the people who are attending either. Mm. Um uh, you know, they are two quite sort of split worlds. And in one world, if I say tabletop miniatures game, they know exactly, they think they know exactly what I mean. And if I say to the other world, a tabletop miniatures game, they think they know exactly what I mean. And if I talk to a bunch of um, Warhammer players and I say, I don't know how to tell board gamers what Warhammer is in a couple of words, and I say, say to them tabletop miniatures game i've had i've had people get into actual discussions with me going no if you say tabletop miniatures game everybody will know what you mean because it's a miniatures game that you play directly on the tabletop when when we were talking about doing this conversation this uh this chat i emailed bez to say i'll talk about tabletop miniatures games and bez was like oh yeah because there's box games there's lots of miniatures in them and that's a game you, you know and it's like people don't the the the, the sorts of games that let's say warhammer are are getting harder and harder to find. You've now got skirmish games, which are boxed games, because always used to, you'd always call them skirmish games. Like, there are now. What's the new thing that Games Workshop has done? Um, you know, they made this tiny thing where it's like something like three models each, and there's a whole card system. Do you know the new ones? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, again, well, that's a, that's a hex-based movement system. Uh, oh, Shadow Shadow Spire Shadow Spire Underworlds. Um, so mm -hmm. with that. So the so the board and that well they they've they've but they're extending the world out and extending it out. So the new one is called something different. Um, I I I tested Shadow Spire when it was when it was very early, um, and that that's a hex based board, and you buy about five miniatures roughly as a war band, and it's a deck builder and a uh, a sort of a hex based uh, war game essentially, um, and again that's one that does it. That game does not care whether you're using miniatures or not at all. But again, you can't get the cards that you need to build the deck to play the game without buying the miniatures. Um, so that's that sort of miniatures as a marketing decision rather than, I would argue, miniatures as a as a uh, game design decision. Um, and obviously, you know, Games Workshop has good valid reasons for getting you a little taster's worth of, of minis because it's sort of okay well you've bought five if you buy another five you can play this next game up and then the next game up and the next game up and then you can get into the whole wonderful world of, of tabletop miniatures gaming so to you a tabletop miniatures game is a game where you've got figurines and then you place them directly on a tabletop and it's not that you've got a board on a tabletop. You definitely don't have any hexes or squares or anything like that or any point-to-point -point movement system. The yeah. mov movement is going to be done using measurement, maybe with a measuring tape or a ruler, probably measuring tape, I yeah. guess, depending on whatever people are using in that area. And you've got this true analog system. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and so, so would you... When you talk about, um, sorry, salute, does, mm. 
is it is there a big divide between the war game realistic miniatures games, if you know what I mean? Like the mm. stuff that is based on actual historical battles, and mm. then games that are based on <laughs> cars smashing against each other in this po- crazy universe or Warhammer or things like that. Um there there are there are certainly historical gamers um that 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 sort of that don't that, that that don't step out from historical gaming. Um, I think there are fewer gamers who play non-historical games who aren't willing to dip into historical. Um, but they're, they're, as as with most parts of the hobby, there are niches of niches of niches. Um, the most I would say the most niche uh, miniatures pl- war gamers are uh, massed naval, massed modern naval battle war gamers. They are a hardcore of themselves because what tends to, uh, on a simulationist level, happen in a modern or relatively modern naval battle is that two warships line up next to each other and just hammer each other until one of their shots happens to hit a, uh, a, 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 a ammo magazine and blow the ship up. And there is a group of war gamers who will demand that what they get from their game is two ships lining up to each other and then two people pouring buckets of dice onto the table until one of them gets a <laughs> six followed by a 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 six, which hits the ammo magazine and blows the ship up. And they'll say, that was brilliant. I loved that game. It was absolutely fantastic. And anything that doesn't do that is a bad game and doesn't deserve to exist. Um, is that literally the only way to end the game? To have like four sixes in a row? I, it, there's 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 like there are there's a theoretical element to those games where you can wear a ship down and grind it out and actually sink it but it it kind of never happens because although the chances of hitting an an ammo because all of the dam- damage tables and all of the damage sort of defense tables have to be realistic and in real life it's very rare that two full you know uh battleships actually grind each other down and stick around to be ground down even if that if they're getting to a point where they realize it's going to happen it's uh yeah it's 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 an odd little sort of part of the of the uh, uh, of the tabletop hobby um i mean that we, sounds it, like something i would um how, it doesn't <laughs> sound like something i would want to do more than once but it's but it's a one it's a 100 realistic recreation of an actual historical event um, and there are people who absolutely love that. And that's what they love in their hobby. And they love getting that out of their hobby. And they love going, yes, that's just the way it should it mm. should be like that. I know what should be true because I know what is true in the real world. And now I have a game that is what it should be. And every other game that prioritizes fun over should is a less correct game than this game that I'm enjoying because my game is the way that things should be and i can prove it because i can map the statistics of my games to real world events and i can go look they match that's brilliant my game is therefore correct and like i said i'm not and i'm and i might sound a little bit judgy there i'm genuinely not um they're lovely guys you know they love their hobby they they believe in it and they stick into it how long does one of these games last are we talking like several hours if I stuck around long enough to watch them play all the way through, um, <laughs> I'd be, I, I'm, I'm aware of them taking, you know, t- a two or three hours isn't considered an unreasonable length for 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 a lot of those sort of, those sorts of games to go on, um, you know. But then the the Na- Napoleonic uh, historical Napoleonic is, you know, is a much bigger area of gaming. Um, and a lot of them are those games people are more than happy that they should take three hours plus um mm, it's you sure. know it, it, it's it, it's 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 a it's a place in gaming where sometimes the longer a game takes the better because if what you're doing is sitting around with a good friend with a mug of nut brown ale sipping it occasionally and <laughs> you know pouring buckets of dice onto the table who really cares how long you spend doing that it's it's like oh this game takes an average of five hours oh that's, fa- uh, that's brilliant we won't have to play two games then we can just do the do the one for the full evening that's that's fantastic we'll start we'll start <laughs> playing about five ish and and we'll get done at a decent time um and you know it's 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 what you it's what you want from your hobby it's what you get out of it and and if you find that an entirely satisfying 
and exciting and fun experience, then that that's great. You know, it's it's you know, it's what it, it's what literally floats your boat. Then I'm very 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 happy for you. <laughs> but in relation to the level of of crossover, the I mean, this is my opinion, but the 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 sort of the the I mean, these I... figurine boats presumably do not literally float. I I I I think that given that a lot of them are, are fair, you know, some people like them There's to be fairly sizable. I don't um, think I I don't think you'd want to put them on the ocean because I imagine some of them cost quite a lot of money. Um, but yeah, I shouldn't I shouldn't think that they would actually float. But um, yeah, as I say, in relation to how much one set of miniatures great gamers crosses over with another, I would I would it would be my opinion that. <laughs> the the historical gamers are less likely to um cross over into fantasy and sci-fi whereas fantasy and sci-fi gamers are more likely to play a historical game and it depends because you've got some saga is is a huge crossover game it's a historical game it's not particularly simulationist but you know it's it's certainly sort of broken out of what you might con consider the historical wargaming niche so i mean but for today um, what's left of it? Um, we are going to be talking about, you know, just expansive things. We've already talked about, um, we've touched upon Simon. I mean, that's basically a lot, big parts of what we're talking about when we talk about box kickstarters that use a lot of minis. I mean, Simon yeah. is the biggest kind of part of that. And did you say it was Shadow Spire? Um, was uh, the I think Games I think Workshop one. Yeah, that, that's one of them. Games Workshop, I think, have really moved into an era of putting out box under, mini games. Now. Um, things, but in the oh, maybe it's Warcry. Maybe that's what I was thinking of. War Warcry, I thought was uh, yeah, is is another one. I, okay, I'm gonna check in. Um, uh, oh no, no, Warcry is totally different. Warcry is not what I was thinking of. Sorry, I'm just looking up and. Um, uh, Warhammer, yeah. So Warhammer Underworlds is the one that's a deck builder, um, and Sh Shadespire was the first uh, sort of chapter in that story. Um, so yeah, that Beast Grave is the new chapter for it. So it's Warhammer Underworlds started with Shadespire, then and then Beast Grave is the new sort of chapter of the story, if you like. Um, okay. So that's the new um, yeah, wave I think this of release. This is the one I was thinking of. Anyway, so like talking about yeah, this so stuff, that's actually, but we're talking about all these things and we're going to compare them and we're going to stop talking about what this is. Otherwise, this whole episode will just be what is a miniatures game and that will be <laughs> it. But, um, you know, whether it's floating components, I don't think that anyone has done a game with floating miniatures. Maybe that is a thing where you put it in and then like whether the water moves it is part of the game. I don't know. Maybe there's like little yeah. anchors on the bottom because you've got to actually have a shallow pool of water. Um, that was yeah, really there's, interesting. It's, yeah, there's been lots of ship-based games that simulate the random movement of of, uh, of the sea and the water. There's been no none that put actual water in and, and give you random movement for it. So maybe that's a way to so somebody to try and uh, breach that, that particular game design problem. Um, Let's move to a question from Javier. Hello, Javier. It's lovely to have you with us, as always. Um, do you know any implementation of minis where the analog parts has been superseded, at least partially, by electronic components? For example, there are several prototypes using NFC or similar to Amiibo figures, but not sure if any product has been released yet. Um, would it solve the in-range discussions you've been mentioning, or would it take the fun out of it? What's your take on that, Glenn? <laughs> Um, so they're, they're a bit, I mean, when, when laser pointers became sort of widely available, that was a huge jump forward in solving the line of sight discussions that inevitably get had with true line of sight in, in minis games. Um, cause you went down from the thing, the, the idea was it used to be is you got your head down to the level of the table and you tried to see what lined up with the head of your mini to see what that mini could see. And then laser pointers came out and then you could just hold the laser pointer <laughs> next to the dude's head and go, well, there you go. I've got you. Cause I, you've got the laser pointer on it. Um, for, uh, for, for the, 
uh, the, 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 the degrees of measurement. Um, weirdly enough, because of the nature of lockdown, we've been playtesting some new games on Tabletop Simulator. And one of the things that Tabletop Simulator does is that you can turn it on so that it precisely measures the movement of any mini in the game. And there are bits about Tabletop Simulator that are, that are quite awkward. That is one of the most time-saving things I, I think I've found in my life, where you just click on a mini and you just wave it around the table and a little number sits next to it head, its head telling you how far you've moved it from its starting point. Um, if, we could, if we could have a little chip in minis that, let, that did that in real life, then I think that would be a huge time-saver. Um, I think that... The, but when you're the... talking about people not wanting their games to last tick too short. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I think that there would there would certainly be a niche of the of the tabletop hobby who who similarly will not use a laser pointer because mm. the discussion over whether or not you can see somebody around a building is the most fun part of the game. Uh, would equally sort of rebel against the idea of not being able to put down a, a, a Having a tape measure that doesn't bend in order to go round a corner um, is something that I think some people willfully enjoy. The sort of, okay, I've moved to here, now I'm going to pivot. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not how you pivot is is a phrase often heard uh, around tabletop miniatures games. That's not how you pivot. You have to wheel at that point. Um so I think I think there are there are ways that I mean you know a bendy piece of plastic with the markings of 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 measurements on them is a huge technological innovation that lots of miniatures gamers refuse to use almost on principle. Um, so I don't I don't think there's necessarily going to mean that when we have a chip that measures how far you moved a mini to the millimeter, everyone's going to jump and get that. Um, but I think it would save people getting called out at, at tournaments. Um, if you if you've been to to I, I back in the day when um, Warhammer uh, the Warhammer tournament used to offer you a ticket to the the grand tournament and so the um, the the qualifying rounds essentially kind of had money riding on it because you were getting a free ticket um, some of those arguments uh, that I was around got pretty 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 unpleasant. Uh, I'd certainly, I was, I was at a table at one of the tournaments where somebody got offered out over a rules decision. So, <laughs> should we go discuss it outside? Um, so, the, if if we can cut down on that happening, were they actually <laughs> looking for a fight? I uh, the other the the other the other guy was more <clears> than happy to just say, "Dude, this is a game with little toy soldiers played on a tabletop. If it means that much to you, you can have the decision." So, uh, happily, I'll never, I'll never know. But I've certainly seen people uh, offered out at gaming tournaments. But then I've, I've seen people banned for using loaded dice. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it used to, it used to be a, a, a peculiar, a peculiar little wow, world. That and... sounds like a really cutthroat thing, and. Um... <laughs> Alex is talking about the little whippy sticks, presumably the stiff yeah, ones yeah. that came before. The, the little bendy, little the little bendy measuring sticks. Yes, if 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 you were of a certain inclination um, and, and weren't just using it to to measure, you could pull it back and flick the person for making a, a movement that you didn't agree with. That that doesn't sound like a <laughs> decent thing to do. Like, what kind <laughs> of people are? Are you? I mean, what in this conversation? I'm just getting the notion that, frankly, I mean, sorry, you're painting miniature tabletop miniatures gamers in a very bad light. You realize that? I I think that the the extremes of if you go to a hardcore tournament of any got any hobby, you'll find uh, extreme and hardcore behaviors. Um, I, I, and I seriously, I, I would, I would imagine that if you went to, um, uh, the, 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 um, Pokemon or Magic the Gathering World Championships, you'd find some people, I mean, famously in the, in the early days of Magic the Gathering, one of their early Hall of Famers used to, uh, in, sit up on the table and scream at his opponent and try and look over their cards in order to psych them out. So it's, it, that's that's the once you go into a tournament realm, once you put money on a game, you see the sorts of behavior. And there's a reason I don't tournament game anymore, to be completely mm. honest with you. Um, and you get a certain thing out of that sort of gaming when you push people to say, okay, 
no background, no wow. fun, <laughs> no letting people off, no giggling around the table. You get a different sort of fun. You get a different sort of test and a different sort of thing. And unfortunately, some people, when they've paid their money and they've gone away for a weekend in a hotel to try and get a certain position on a leaderboard, go a little bit nuts when when they drop their first game and they realize yeah for they, sure and it's like this is the thing especially when money there's money on the and, table and, and they engage in funny like, behaviors i'm sure that the worst of miniatures gamers i guess it, there's going to be a bit of money but not massive amounts but there's a bit of okay this is the biggest thing going got in my life and there's that kind of sense of validation because you win the tournament Whereas when he gets into Magic the Gathering, there's also, you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds at stake, um, which is ridiculous. Mm. But, you know, we, we've got, had a good overview of what miniatures games are. And I think mm. this is like being a decent like background. So let's talk about why from the tournament scene where you say, yeah, it can be a bit nuts. How, why are miniatures games good? <laughs> why might people want to try a miniatures game? Um, so I, a lot of the time, I think of um, some of the formative uh, times in my uh, hobby life were so uh, way way back when for the for people who remember Hero Quest. There's a page in the middle of the Hero Quest um, quest booklet, which is an entirely blank page. It's got the line, the the the, the outline of the board, and a, and a blank piece of paper, and it's create your own world. Um, and for me, the, um, the the tabletop miniatures gaming is somewhere between an RPG, which is like total freedom. You can just do do anything, where, wherever enters your imagination, to uh, a, a boxed board game, which is very much like, okay, you've got to be within the constraints of this board. You can only do what it says on these cards. You, you can only do on these rules. Uh, a tabletop miniatures game is somewhere between the two of those where you have a sandbox you have a freedom you have a world you can play with um there there's a there's a, a huge community uh i think in the tabletop miniatures game which is about modding games fiddling with them extending them uh you know writing a new sort of weapon for 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 your vehicle uh writing a new troop type writing a new hero porting your rpg character over into your tabletop game um and i think that that freedom that you can have in in a tabletop miniatures game is it's the main reason that i play tabletop miniatures games that there is um, there's something about a, a, a sort of an openness to them, uh, a, an ability to to make a world uh, and create something that isn't quite so available in uh, in standard board games. I mean, it's, when when I'm sitting down to design a game, I have a moment where I've got to decide whether the game is going to be a board game or uh, a, a, a miniatures tabletop game. Um, and for me. The tabletop miniatures game is the one that justifies not having any components because the fewer components I have, the more rules I need to write. Uh, in a tabletop miniatures game, I've got to put down rules for every single thing that happens, every single thing that might happen, and everything you might have in your collection. In a in a box board game, I can say you can do anything it says on X card, and I don't need to explain that rule because I've got the cards, and they'll they'll explain themselves to some degree. Um, so, so for me, the tabletop miniatures games have fewer um, constraints and therefore fewer components, uh, but therefore more rules. Um, but yeah, I think I think as a gamer, it's it for me. It's, as a gamer, it's the freedom that they offer um, to to build a world, to 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 build miniatures, to uh, convert things up. There's a huge hobby community. If you know. Looking at the Gasland, so some Gaslands modded cars there on the screen. Um, if you if you go on the Gaslands Facebook group and you see people who have taken Hot Wheels cars and modded them to be the uh, the twisted metal cars, or modded them to be um, a, you know a set of Mario cars, or, or or those sorts of things, it's that sort of freedom, that sort of creativity that that miniatures games open up for you that you can't you you know you can't really have in a normal uh, box board game. You know, I can't. I've got a Warhammer army, uh, which is an undead army, where everything in it is a it's a circus. 
So there's a, a massive mummer kill balancing on a ball mm. to beat all of the undead monsters. I can't do that in a in a boxed game. I can't even really do that, justify doing that in an, in an RPG. I can only pull out that sort of insane level of weirdness in a, a tabletop miniatures game. And that's when I love them, that's what I love about them, personally. So it sounds like, yeah, it's clear the amount of enthusiasm and love that's coming through when you speak about this, that potential, as you talk about how it's just a way to get started, that you make these things uniquely yours. Mm. And I guess, in a way, maybe that is a thing that <sighs> Zombicide might actually capture a little bit of, that you are painting these things at least, even mm. if you aren't necessarily modding it, even if you aren't adding in your own terrain and adding in these new features and saying, okay, how are these roles going to interact with a river? Mm. Is this Does this count as a river or does it count as a lake? I don't know what. Presumably yeah. there's games where you've got alternate rules for the two of them. And maybe no, you say, okay, this is a fast flowing river and now yeah. we've got different rules. And then maybe you invent your own rules because you say, okay, in this version, we're playing on this table with this extremely fast point. I don't know. But yeah, no, no, absolutely. That is that is absolutely the thing of a, of a tabletop miniatures game, I, I, I would say. Um, and I think or, uh, certainly a lot of us who've been in the hobby for a while remember the the early days of, of, of some of the games where you... You know, you you, I, I remember playing Blood Bowl and gluing together two um, death rollers and going, okay, this is now a double dozer, and writing my own <laughs> set of rules for it, um, and trying to suggest to my friends that those rules were in any way balanced or fair, which they obviously <laughs> weren't. But that's not the point. I just glued together two death rollers, and by God, I want to see it on the tabletop because <laughs> it's bound to be amazing. Um, and yeah, that's the, I, I think that's the thing that for a, a lot of I think designers who started off in that world started off in that sort of i'm going to write a new unit i'm going to write a new scenario i'm going to write a new piece of terrain and i'll put it in the game and then we'll we'll see what happens and they're games that let you drop stuff into them they'll let you like you say drop in a fast flowing river into the middle of a game of warhammer let's see how that affects the system let's see how that affects the sort of the the ecosystem of the game there's now this weird thing in the middle of the table that does weird things. Is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? We might nudge it next time. We might fiddle it out. I mean, it's why I, I think earlier you were talking about um, uh, back in the days of HG Wells and the sort of the very mm. earliest tabletop miniatures games. All those very early games, which were for training um, military officers, always required that there be a referee by the table. Um, and by and large, they were games about sort of explaining what you were going to do in the referee making calls. Um, and possibly it's one of the things we've lost from the tabletop miniatures world is the referee by the table going, yeah, sure, your giant can wade that river. He's enormous. Other people can't. And you know what? If your giant dies on the river, you can use him as a pontoon. Why not? Cross over <laughs> his course. Um and that's something that, you know, it would be lovely if every miniatures game could have a referee coming with it, but people, for good reason, don't want to have to be the referee who sits there for an hour and then gets asked one question and then gets shouted down by somebody because they said the thing that they, they didn't enjoy hearing. Um, but hopefully the rule set can be robust enough that it will let you referee your own games and throw in your own alterations and your own creations and your own ideas. Um, it's one of the things that... Uh, quite often because Gaslands is quite an uh, a sort of beginner yeah, because you chose to kind of embrace the sense of possibilities and mm. Gaslands almost more than anything else because you actually do not sell anything for it you no. kind of say okay here's a post apocalyptic mad max style crash into each other world and mm. so you've got to bring this stuff and do you see a lot of modding of rules then for this um, we, we, I, I, we, we see people putting together house rules for it. Um, I, I, there are some of the new rules that ended up going into Gaslands Refueled came out of the community. Um, there, there's at least one scenario in there that, that came from the community. Um, there are, you know, weapons and teams that are based on suggestions from the fans and, uh, you know, and a build up from, from our sort of communications with them. 
Um, and yeah, I continue to see mods and house rules, and I love it when I see them. I love it when somebody starts putting together a mod for something that we tried and threw out because we couldn't justify the number of rules it would take to make it work. Um, and personally, as a game designer, I love some seeing somebody go down the same sort of path we went down, but with more more space. Because that's the thing about a, a homebrewed rule. It can be 20 pages long and incredibly labyrinthine and require loads of bookkeeping because you don't need to sell it to anybody. So if you want to make a rule to, to simulate the tire pressure on your Gaslands car, crack on with it, have fun. Game don't care. That's one of the things we often say, because because Gaslands is a quite gateway miniatures game, because you don't need to buy miniatures for it, everything mm -hmm. that you need to play is in the book. We get quite a few people who come in from a more board game side and are like, am I allowed to do this? Am I allowed to do that? Am I allowed to do this with it? And it's like, I'm not going to come around to your house. I'm not the tabletop game police. Game don't care. If you're having fun, Play the game with whatever you've got to hand. It, the game doesn't care what type, size your table is. The game doesn't care whether you're using Jenga blocks as, as terrain and, and pushing around cutouts. And the game doesn't care if you chain together two buses and create a bus whiplash maneuver uh, to wipe out ha half, the, half the field. If you have fun with it, then yes, that's the right way to play it. Um, I love it when people house rule the game to make it better for them. You know, I'm not I'm not the knower of all things. I don't know what's going to work best for your group and your tabletop and your way of playing. So, you know, have fun with it. It's a real best set of rules. It will take you tinkering with it without it snapping. I think this is the thing about house rules that when a designer publishes a set of rules, it's just, okay, this is the best set of rules for the target audience and the kind of general target audience that I'm going for. So maybe your group is not exactly that target audience. And mm. maybe you think, okay, this is 90% of what we want, but actually we would like to tweak it to be, maybe we want it to be a bit more complex and have more detail in it. Maybe mm. we want to um, make this game a bit longer and use more minis, or maybe we want it to be a bit shorter and have at it. And that's the thing that. Um, sure, there's a line to be drawn between, well, if you've got to change too much, maybe you should have started with a different game anyway. I mean, mm. you don't start Malifaux and think, okay, I want this game to be a proper simulation game. Yeah. I mean, what on earth are you doing in that situation? Like Malifaux or War Machines are pretty, um, I'm going to say, board gamey experiences because it's all about the action points and... Do you know what I mean? Like, it's a lot yeah, of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. very abstracted away. It's not simulationist yes. at all. No, um, yeah, Mal Malifaux is often a geometry problem as much as it is anything else. But, um, like, I'm coming from it from a point of view of this is a thing that interests me. I have spent several evenings going around. Uh, okay, so let's talk about some pitfalls. I'm just going to bring it up. Like, the fact that these things are blooming expensive. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. And so what um, other problems are there with miniature games other than the cost and that kind of accessibility? You need to paint them and like going into it, like I used to so Glasgow Games Group, I assumed are not running currently because you know COVID mm. and everything, but mm. they used to meet up um Great Western Road used once a week. I would go in there. Sometimes it was for my own RPG games, but like when we weren't meeting, I would still go there, wander around. And be like, okay, can I have a go of Balfour? And a lot of people say, yeah, if you want to go of our mm. game, I will bring you an extra army. So I didn't have to, you know, mm. buy something necessarily to get started. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, uh, I mean, it's it, it's an interesting uh, one bringing up Malifaux there, because I think Malifaux has, uh, depending on your point of view, suffered from or benefited from one of the big pitfalls of an ongoing miniatures game. And that's something that's, that's been termed grognard capture, um, which is where you get your first edition of, of a given game uh, and it's a certain level of complexity and everyone plays the game and then 10% of people get are the worst players. And so they stop playing the game um, and then you get 90% of people that remain and 10% of them are now the worst players. Now they've got no one they can beat, so they just keep losing, so they stop playing the game. And that goes on for a certain amount of time. And then when you get to release the second edition, you've got a core of people who aren't necessarily enough people to sort of 
to 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 launch a game on because they're the sort of the residual hardcore and they want something more complicated and more with more depth and more moving parts than the previous edition so you make your second edition more complicated with more moving parts and then that process goes on again with the second edition and then you go to your third edition and I, you know, I I played Malifaux first edition, and I, and I I really loved it. I got very into it. I played Malifaux second edition. I drifted off because I was working on other games. And I didn't have the time to keep up. Right around third edition comes out, and now I honestly couldn't. I I couldn't get back into third edition. It's it's hardcore homework learning. Uh, Malifaux, you know, the new Malifaux uh, game, because you need to learn all of the way that all of the miniatures interact with all the other miniatures. You've got to learn your own force, and then you'll learn everybody else's forces to be sort of realistically competitive. Um, and so and, uh, some people sort of think of it as being related to power creep, but there is there is an inherent thing no, where... No, it's complexity creep. It's completely different. And I know yeah, that yeah, this yeah. is something yeah. that Mark Rosewater talks about all the time for Magic the Gathering, where you've got to really... Co- battle against this you've got to be mm. thinking about okay how many words am i using on a cards or how long are these rules like mm. and be because i know that magic gathering obviously like it's done well financially of course it is it's like the biggest blooming mm. um board game in the world but so this is um they talk about retention and acquisition and also reacquisition of players where mm. for, i like what well, yeah these marketing terms make it feel like very cold and calculating which i don't <laughs> quite like but yeah you've got to be willing to embrace new players and make it accessible to them so that new players mm. can come onto the game and join in you've got to also all those people who left why did they leave if it's mm. just because hey they've got this brand new job and they don't have the time then fair enough but if it's because there was this issue in the game then why mm. not have them come back yeah. and yeah, and I think thre- threading the complexity needle between making your new version of the game complex enough to satisfy the core audience from the previous edition and get back people back in who dropped off or allow new players to pick it up. I think that's a, because one of the things about a tabletop miniatures game is that you need to you need to bring out a new edition to keep to keep the game running. You have to to, to relaunch the rules and and you know if you're going to make it into a franchise. And every time that a game relaunches, it has to thread that very difficult needle. Um, and I think that there are some games that in the later editions have struggled with threading that needle. Um, and I think that, uh, yeah, I think that could be a major pitfall. Picking up, I mean, I, I, I lived with Warhammer from like third edition up until its demise. And so to me, by the time we got to seventh edition, it was as natural as breathing, the, the, the game flow and the systems. And the idea that there were 20 different armies with 20 different sets of stats and special abilities and spells was just like, well, yeah, they'll be minorly different from the one two editions ago. That's fine. I can fall right into that. Hitting a new player with, okay, here's the library you need to read to understand everything that might come up at you in this game is is a terrifying thing to drop on onto a, a, total, a totally new player. Um, and in a way that the most expanded board game in the world doesn't get close to visiting that horror uh, upon a new player. You know, a really, really heavily expanded board game has got maybe like a, a, a manual that thick at the most. It doesn't require you to read, you know, over a thousand pages worth of stuff to get completely caught up with the rules. Um, so I think I think that's one thing that, that a larger franchise game can, can suffer from. Um, well, I think it's worth kind of starting to. <clears throat> Sorry about this. Um, starting to look at those questions that we pondered earlier to make sure that, hey, I wrote some questions in the YouTube thing. I want to make sure we actually address those questions. Um, so what is a good miniatures game? Like what I'm learning here is that there's so many different things like to so many different people that, yeah, we can't, that first most... Um, whatever you say is not going to be the same as those naval battles people who like hmm. rolling the bucket loads of D6 or whatever. I mean, for, for me, what what I think makes uh, a, a good miniatures game and what I would ask anybody who's thinking of doing a, a new miniatures game is 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 an innovation 
within the, me- the the mechanics of the game. I can't tell you how many games, uh, tabletop miniatures games, I pick up, and I look at the theme of the game, and then I imagine the most root one, basic, standard version of the game that I could probably write out in about twenty minutes. And lo, as I read the book, that's exactly what this you know hundred page book is. For, for the love of all that people stop making those games stop making just another skirmish game it it it, it it's ah it's it, it makes me so upset that there are gay books that are made that are published that are put out there and have taken up the space that something innovative and intelligent and interesting could be occupying and it's been filled with exactly the same as a a miniatures game five books ago only we've renamed the guns and the units you know i that absolutely uh drives me insane and so i think well so having uh, said that there is some value in familiarity for sure and you you can evolve rather than but i think what you're saying is that there's a lot of things that are just someone's put this together they've maybe played it with their friends and just like any board games you've got to play test it with people you've got to make sure that you're contributing something to that landscape whether it's an evolution or whether it's just an improvement Mm. yeah i I think one of the things and and I've, i've spoken to different designers and i've heard different opinions about why it is but the the tabletop miniatures game community suffers a bit from people reinventing the wheel um, mm. People going, okay, I've written this from the ground up and it's a functional tabletop miniatures game. Therefore, it, it, it's a good thing to put into And I think it's one of the, it, it's like in, in role playing games, you people use each other's systems. A lot of role playing games use this system or that system and are powered by the apocalypse or, you know, or whatever it happens to be. Mm. Um, and, I, and I genuinely don't really understand why there isn't more of that in the tabletop miniatures game because so many tabletop miniatures systems run on what is essentially a generic uh, sort of set of rules there's there's the the rule for movement the rule for it's either true line of sight or abstract line of sight um you've you've either got uh being pinned in combat or being able to walk away from close combat you've got melee combat you'll have a way of charging into melee combat there are so many of these rules that are so standard and so unnecessary to rewrite and because somebody has rewritten them they feel like they've created a game and it's like you have created a game but you've created a game that already exists um, and because you've themed it differently, you then put it out into the world. And it's like, feel free to take somebody, build on what somebody else has made, stand on somebody else's shoulders. Well, do you think this is and because they are so long that people aren't wanting to play all the variety of things out there? Whereas, I mean, if you are working in the toy industry, it doesn't take that long to kind of look at and play with literally everything that comes out that's notable. And if you work for kids' games at a certain point, well, if I'm making a speed game, how difficult is it for me to read up on literally everything that's available? Because those rules should be instantly understandable, whereas if I want... And playing a game should be quite fast, or blooming speed games. Whereas if I want to do a new RPG or a new miniatures games, maybe that's the barrier that it would take so many hours to... Try out the I mean, system. I, well, I mean, for, for, through knowing tabletop miniatures gamers, most tabletop miniatures gamers play a lot of systems, and most of the ones I know read far more systems than they actually play, um, because ultimately most tabletop miniatures games it, are a book, uh, and people read books because they like reading books, um, mm. and and a lot of tabletop miniatures gamers just own a shelf of 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 games. And they read them to enjoy reading reading a thing. So I I I don't think it's um, I think there are parts of the hobby where people get their head down and they get into the system that they're in and they never look at another system. But by and large, and certainly now, like I say, with the the dropout of Fantasy Battle, um, I think you've got a lot of a lot of the gamers do look at multiple systems. Um, why it happens? I honestly, I th- I think part of it is because tabletop miniatures games remain obsessed with the story of two bunches of people killing each other and there are a relatively limited number of ways you can retell that story in mechanics there are a relatively limited number of ways that one dude can shoot another dude and kill him 
Um, and I think, and it, and this is something that I that, that you know I really do believe is that the that part of the hobby is only going to be able to catch up to the golden age in the the the, the board game part of the hobby is if we start doing other things in those games. We start saying, you know, look, if you've got a bunch of miniatures and it matters where they move and who they can see and and you care about the interactions they have, why shouldn't they be a a a a, a, a ballroom party in a Jane Austen novel where people are trying to corner each other in order to talk them into marrying other people? Why shouldn't they be in an Agatha Christie novel where somebody's got to get into a room with somebody else in order to bump them off and then somebody else has got to be able to see the evidence before the other person moves away? Why are we stuck doing games where people shoot each other? Why? why? Uh, and because I think that that part, that niche is so removal obsessed, um, you know, the game is ultimately removing a model from the table is the most powerful thing you can do. And even if you've got, objective based games ultimately i will always be easier for me to achieve my objective if i've taken your models off the table um mm. and, and we get more and more scenario based ones and more and more objective based ones and they're great and they're lovely but they always have the option of well complete the objective by murdering all the other people that's always going to be an option and so a force that always that always takes the the murder gun is always going to be able to achieve their objectives by just firing the murder gun and then walking around an empty tabletop yeah. going, ha-ha, I have found the clues and, <laughs> and I have dug up the treasure as as every uh, looking at the mouldering corpses of my enemies. Yeah, so what you're saying is that where you are able to eliminate the other force and then complete your objective, you know, that's always an opportunity and a, a way that you could do it. And if it's not... Like, I really love kind of what you've said about maybe it is a murder mystery where you're trying to or dig up a thing or get to a thing, mm. but you're you're all working together and maybe you're trying to be the best crime solver. But hey, if you kill someone, well, you're all working mm. on, you're all meant to be working on the same team. So there's actually inter-office politics. But if you were to kill someone, well, you'd get sacked instantly, wouldn't you? Mm. And so, um, I mean, yeah. maybe locked up in prison, I'd hope. But yeah. um yeah, Chris yeah. is saying um like going back to it's all about the books, Chris is agreeing with this. D and D there's so many settings using the core rules and we can work on well, not me because I don't work on D and D stuff, but pe other people could work on the world or characters, which is the important thing in what they're making. And mm. um I really yeah, love this idea. And do you have anything more to say about what you'd like to see from yeah. miniatures games? In a yeah, I mean, what, as I say, what I, what I would what I would love to be in the future is more diversity in the sorts of games that you know. As I say, you look at RPGs and you've got games like Starcross, which are about two people sitting around a table falling in love. Um, you, you know, you, you you've got a. Uh, box games like uh uh holding on the the uh troubled life the of billy kerr which sort of troubled life of billy kerr yeah e exactly you've got you've got those games that try and tell a story uh, of a little bit more breadth a little bit more diversity a little bit more interest to more people and then you go to the tabletop miniatures world and look i i love a game where you know there's a tactical thing about blowing up a tank and I and I love a game where it's about maneuvering to see who can wipe out the other warband first, or or who can get to a certain location whilst being shot at as they climb a hill. But why can't we see a game, you know, within that field using those mechanics as part of that niche that when just no one gets shot, you know, mm. where where that where we try to look at eh, maybe there's another story to tell, maybe there's another story we can tell within this framework. You know, because I think that until we do that, that that part of the hobby is never going to broaden itself in the way that the I believe that the board game hobby um, is at the moment, in a way that a lot of the RPG hobby is at the moment. Um, and as somebody who loves these games and loves what they can do and loves the the freedom that they offer people, I I get worried that it's just going to get left left behind in that respect. That we that we don't get people that are more you know, that are more diverse and interested in different things, that are a wider community 
at those conventions, playing those games at those tournaments makes me sad. It makes me sad in my heart. And I, and I want to be able to say to somebody, okay, here's a tabletop miniatures game and it's about falling in love. You know, let, let's do that. Let's have that be a thing. Or um, a game about flirting at a dance with, and, oh, can he see me? And maybe line of sights is actually what you want. You want to be in the middle of someone's line of sights. That would be yeah, quite... Exactly. Yeah, we've got a Jane Austen game. I give somebody a love note and, and, and my person has to go and approach that other person, but I can't approach them directly because of the rank of my person. I've got to hand the love note off to a servant and is the servant going to be able to get round and track down the person and get in close with them and hand the love note over? So oh, I get and to then when you get seen, person. you kind of lose some honour or kind of there's some gossip yeah. about you. Maybe that's an issue. Um, yeah, why... Why can't we have that? <laughs> why, why is that? Why are we not willing to have that as a thing? Um, well, yeah, you're that, the person who makes games like tabletop miniatures I, games. You I, I, bring it up with Osprey. I, 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 I have bought. <laughs> try and sell a PG Woodhouse based tabletop miniatures game to Osprey, and 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 you will see the likelihood of this happening. Um, um, see, we've got yeah. at least one. And I don't think, I think this has been like a long time mulling in, you know, not in, sorry, one of the people here. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, what separates board games with managed miniatures from stuff like Warhammer, Malifaux, Gaslands? Um, I think that we've decided that these things, the thing that separates tabletop miniatures games, as you call them, from um yeah box just games. Simon box games it's basically the fact that a you've got the measurement and b it's that scope for adding stuff mm, would you say that so. summarizes it yeah yeah i'd say the 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 analog play element is the game design justification and and the the hobby community fiddling and and tinkering with it um, I think is it, yeah, it's a it's a huge part of them and a huge part of the difference. Okay, um, I wanted to ask you, um, to, to, whoops, um, what kinds of games shouldn't have miniatures added? Um, we didn't really get into that. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I mean, uh, obviously there are some games that totally shouldn't have miniatures added i don't i don't think that you should you know put miniatures into a card game just to be sitting by the side of the table um i suppose the 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 question is you know if you've got a marker on the table that can 100 percent be fulfilled by as you say a flat 30 mil disc should you force somebody to buy a miniature to fill that disc out and 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 i think that's that's the divisive question it's not you, you you buy Warhammer, you don't have to buy a, a single miniature for it. Um, uh, if you buy Zombicide, you can't not buy the zombie miniatures. You are not given a choice to, to opt out from that. How you feel about not having that option to opt out of, of, of buying the miniatures for a game that you want to play because you're interested in the mechanics... I, I think that's a divisive issue um, as to whether or not they should be created. Um, yeah, like you say, uh, big, big miniatures-based box games on uh, crowdfunding is, as I say, I, I, yeah, they, 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 that'll split the crowd right down the middle, I think, that particular issue. And so, yeah, as we finish up, um, yeah, we had what are the essential parts of a miniature game i think we've already covered that multiple times why are they worth playing like we heard this really impassioned speech from you have they been able to evolve i think that we could get into this a little bit more but you've got some great ideas for other themes that we could get into a bit more but mm. the mechanically even if the thematically are just the same have they been able to evolve at all mechanically <laughs> It sounds um, like reinventing I, the wheel constantly might be a thing that actually keeps you held back if you're not willing think, to build on the shoulders of giants. Yeah, I, I, I think that the, the games that have gone big 
have evolved mechanically. So he's, you talk about Malifaux. Um, you know, the, the thing about Malifaux, there's that the deck of cards for the randomization and the hand management that you have available. And opening up hand management within the mechanics of a, of a tabletop miniatures game is a, is a genuine me mechanical innovation. I think that for for me, that's what grabbed me to play Malifaux. Um, mm. You know, you look at a game like Infinity and Infinity's um, interrupt system, uh, where you can react to what other people are doing, it is a is a genuine mechanical innovation within. Uh, tabletop games. Uh, Drop Fleet Commanders uh, got a spike system for when you can track what other ships are doing. So the the the, the games that I think get a lot of respect and and also get get a lot of traction are the games that have done something which is mechanically interesting and mechanically different. Um, and so there is that innovation available, and it's available there even though these these themes are relatively limited. Um, I think the problem is that it, it remains an area that that has a, an awful lot of non-innovative design. It's you know, and I, I, you see it in the board game um, field to a degree, where you go, okay, it, it, it's a worker placement game. What do I need to know other than the fact that it's a worker placement game? Oh well, literally nothing. So long as you know it's a worker placement game, or a take that game, or a, a you know deck builder, you know everything about the game. You know, uh, 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 you know, and, and you can just move on from there. Um, and I think that it, I think it's a problem in a lot of parts of, of 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 design. I think that the because the tabletop miniatures hobby is a little more niche than the board game hobby, it's possibly a more damaging tendency than it is in in the in the board game community. Would be my opinion. I think um, that makes a lot of sense. It's been a really um great thing um chris wants you to come on to their own show brains behind games if you're interested in that yeah you know i'm 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 always always happy to uh to, to, to hang out and have a random conversation about games design um i don't know if uh you this will have the link to the mannequin website on it won't it yeah, so um the mannequin website um yeah so i you can see all of it on the comments in YouTube or Facebook and in Twitch. I just um, sent everything out. So if you want to find yeah. out, where do you most like to be found currently? Um, uh, well, the Mannequin Games has, uh, I think, an email link to it. But you can, to be honest, whichever is easier for people. Feel free to hit us up on Twitter. Uh, feel free to find the website and email us by the uh, uh, by the, the 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 form that's on the website. Um, yeah, I'm I'm more than happy. You can always look me up on Board Game Geek. Um, however, however I get communications, I'm just happy to have have the conversation. Um, but yeah, I'd be more than happy to go on anybody else's um, podcasts, vods. Uh, uh, video chats I'm, I'm i'm always available <laughs> you've got to get yourself out there so um if people want to check out the um kickstarter then can you give a quick um two minutes pitch to what this is all about Good score. okay uh so the current kickstarter uh sso rage of montalbano is um it's a fancy pants expansion to our first Kickstarter SSO, so you can pick up the, the base set um, on the campaign. It's a one to six player um, survival horror sci-fi game um, where something horrifying, terrible has happened to the original crew of the SS Amiga and wiped out the crew. You turn up, you've got to survive through whatever happened to the original crew and outlast it. In the base set, you're essentially playing through 2001 A Space Odyssey. The AI of the ship has wiped out the original crew, and it's going to try and kill you as well. Um, in the expansion, which we're kickstarting, the, uh, the Captain Montalbano was passed over for command of the Amiga and has weaponized the Amiga sister ship and is coming to kill you all um, as the game goes on. So... That's the that's the 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 quick version of it. It tells a bunch of sci-fi. So there are challenge decks that you can um, swap in and out, and each of them tells a different 
sci-fi survival horror movie story um so yeah that's that's uh that's where it's at we're um we've knocked off a couple of stretch goals um we're fully backed so you know we're into the we will be on the last 72 hours in 15 minutes so it's running down to the to the last um last parts of the campaign so if you want to stop by and check it out let us know what you think and that is obviously available if you go to manokentgames.com that will possibly de- be the easiest way to yep. find it um do 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 and so yep i want if to you, if you type in sso if if you type in SSO um, on Kickstarter, three things will come up and two of them will be my games. So, so we've covered so much today. Um, we had you on, we talked about 40k, Fantasy, Malifaux, War Machine, like Second Dates, Car Wars, Gloomhaven, Clank, and justification for things, like design justifications, about the measurements, about binging on stuff, about... Um, just binging on buckets loads of dice and so for like five <laughs> hours until eventually an ammo thing kind of explodes. About marketing, about bringing in your own campaign, about a billion sons with multiple tables, about um, doing stuff directly on the tabletop, about using tech, about laser pointers for line of sight, the potential of bringing your own world to it, like RPGs kind of, about modularity, about adding rules, about sculpting your own new miniatures, about... Yeah, what you called Grognard capture, which I would just call complexity creep, about price, about innovation, that there could be so much more with these miniatures going around, about not reinventing the wheel, about having objective-based stuff that it still comes to be about removing someone's stuff, about having more exciting stories, about minis in boxes, adding costs and making it more accessible, but less, sorry, less accessible, but obviously you have um, the whole, um, you know, it's not for us to say what someone should do or shouldn't do. But, mm. um, yeah, now I want to say thank you very much, everyone. Thank you to my amazing um, mods. Um, basically, thank you very much to Xate, who are amazing, and thank you to Chris, who's been so brilliant like the past few days at just being so welcoming to everyone and asking some amazing questions and like Javier like that was a really interesting shout out and to everyone else who's like just been part of this thank you for like joining this conversation and also obviously um thank you um Glenn so now it is over to you. What are you up to? You can share only if you want to. So is there anything that you want to share? Maybe it's something you want to look forward to, hopes and ambitions. You can share anything, whether it's exciting or trivial, the boring facts about yourself, something that's important, or maybe it's just fun. Um, I want to share the fact that I'm getting to see Chris and McCall tonight, which I know I do this most weeks, but tonight, you know, we're meeting a little later than usual. But, you know, it's okay. I still get to see them. We still get to play a game together. I'm looking forward to it. They are, like, two of my favorite people in the world. I'm sorry, Xate. I still love you. But anyway, like, it's wonderful going there. And, like, I'm going to, yeah, try and get a little bit of work done, a bit of writing, a bit of reading, a bit of tinkering. And, yep, yeah, that's me. What are you up to, Glenn? What's uh... your I, I'm I'm I've I've just done a major rewrite on what will hopefully be our next big game that we're we're launching. Um a thing called Song of Tales, which is a fairy tale storytelling game. Um and hopefully I'll be rebuilding the print and play and maybe putting up a tabletop simulator mod of that over the next week. So that that that's that's my big job, other than finishing a Kickstarter and and starting a print run, which is also gonna be a big thing that's gonna happen in the next uh three to four days so th- those are the main things for me today those are exciting things so like get onto that kickstarter because it's going to finish in like it's not quite hours yet but it's three and it's, a bit days yeah yeah seven, 72 hours and 11 minutes at the at the, at the moment well you, you get to see that because you are actually the creator of course in the back end <laughs> um and yeah, if you want to share what you're up to, please do so. 
um, share, spread the word. I am um, going to try and get categorical completely redrawn by Wednesday. We will see how that goes. It's not going to be the final things. It's just kind of getting proof of colors, if you know what I mean. Proof of like orientations and getting the letter shapes so we can get it all printed up and put pasted up and made reality. I'm having the Beds and Friends game day on Saturday 17th of October. Put that into your calendar. I hope to see at least a couple of you there. Um, it would be lovely to have you. There's a Discord, which I will try and set up the rules and stuff um, today. Um, if you want to find out the next streams, look up stuffbebez.com slash streams and you would find out that do, 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 do. tomorrow is about the value of familiarity with Mandela, Fernandez, Grandon, and or FG. Um, then we're going to be talking about interviewing with Chris. Hi, Chris, from the chat, who's going to be joining me on this side. And that's going to be really interesting. And then there's all sorts of things. I am here every day at 10 a.m. If you think that there's at least one person who would be interested, in, then please let them know about it. Um, yeah, that is, I think, everything. Um, does anyone have anyone to anything else to share before we skedaddle? No, nope, I'm all good. Okay, um, let me just um, see if there's any good music makers that Twitch people could listen together. Oh, Amadeus Musics. So I'm going to do a raid. I know that... Um, sometimes not everyone likes it but um this is genuinely someone who just basically plays music and doesn't talk much so maybe this is quite a nice thing as we start to get into our work day we can just listen to someone playing the piano and so i'm going to start that raid um for now there is only one thing left to do and that one thing left to do is to say bye 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 this is the goodbye song. Bye bye, bye bye. Thank you for watching along. <laughs> bye bye, bye bye. This is the end of the show. Bye bye, bye bye. And now it's time to go to do do bye 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 bye. This is the goodbye song. Bye bye, bye bye. Thank you for watching along. Bye bye, bye bye. This is the end of the show. Bye, 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 bye. And this is the end of the show. And bye, 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 bye. And now it's time to go. Bye bye. You're allowed to say bye if you want. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to interrupt the song? Here's a lovely song.